Hi, I'm Jack Baker. With this video, I want to give you a very brief introduction to some key concepts from probabilistic seismic hazard analysis. Uh, and I'll note you see a reference to a textbook here at the bottom of the um, slide. Uh, let me show you a picture of the cover as well. So with this video and some accompanying videos, I'm going to introduce some concepts uh, described in m much greater detail in this book, uh, Seismic Hazard and Risk Analysis, written by myself, Professor Brendan Bradley, and Professor Peter Stafford. Uh, if you go to this website, pshabook.com, you can find out lots more information about uh, where to obtain the book. There's also accompanying uh, software that does some of the calculations I'll illustrate in these figures and things like that. With the video, I'm just going to give you some very brief uh, introduction to some key concepts. Uh, I can't cover everything that's in the book, but uh, if this is uh, compelling and you need more details, uh, hopefully you can find some useful information there. Okay, so with this video, I'm going to cover chapter one, or not cover chapter one, but uh, take a few ideas from chapter one and, and highlight them here for a few minutes. Okay, so let's get started. The uh, idea with seismic hazard analysis is we're thinking about uh, ground shaking that could occur at a site due to earthquakes. We want to look at it probabilistically. There's no kind of single worst case ground motion or obvious ground motion we should design for. There's really a, a probability distribution of what we could observe. Uh, we can't estimate that directly from observations, uh, and so we're going to use this probabilistic seismic hazard analysis calculation as a slightly more involved calculation that'll help us get to our goals. All right, so let's jump in and, and think about that. So ultimately, where we want to get to is to get a ground motion hazard curve. And so that's what's uh, illustrated in the figure on the right here. So on the horizontal axis, we've got some metric of ground motion intensity. This could be a, you could think of a peak ground acceleration now for simplicity. There's other metrics of shaking intensity that could be down here. And so we've got kind of on the left, low intensity shaking up to very strong intensity shaking. And then the vertical axis is showing the annual rate of exceedance. Um, so how often per year on average would we see an exceedance of that level of ground shaking intensity? So the left uh, low amplitude ground motion intensities are exceeded frequently with a high annual rate. And as you get to um, larger intensities, the rate of exceedance gets lower and lower. And we want to quantify that curve, which is called a ground motion hazard curve. So importantly for our applications, we're typically interested in low rates of exceedance. Um, so you know, uh, you know, less than 1 in 100 per year is, is very common, maybe less than 1 in 1,000 per year. Uh, building codes uh, utilize ground, ground motion amplitudes that are exceeded every few hundred to few thousand years for lots of structures and for special structures even maybe to once every 10,000 years or more. And so because we want to maintain the reliability of those systems, we need to think about these, these rare um, occurrences of large amplitude shaking. But we also can't estimate those by direct observation, right? So you could imagine you know, the idea of putting a ground motion instrument at a site and letting it sit and observe ground shaking. But if we're interested in, you know, things that happen only once every few hundred years or few thousand years, um, clearly we need to wait a long time to observe those. And actually to estimate the rates of exceedance accurately, we'd need multiple observations. And so, you know, on the order of, of 10 times uh, the interval between shaking is, is kind of how long we would have to leave an instrument there. So we'd have to leave instruments out for thousands of years. And that's not practical for decisions that we need to make in the near term. Okay, so uh, that's a, just a very quick argument for why this direct observation isn't practical. You could, uh, again, see the book for more details on all these arguments. But the PSHA approach uh, tries to work around that. And what we do is we take two input models. So the first model is for how often earthquakes occur on nearby sources, so not how often the ground motions occur, how often the, the earthquake ruptures themselves occur. And so we want to think about activity rates of, of nearby sources of earthquakes. And that's actually easier to um, infer than the ground motions directly. And then we want to also build a model for the resulting ground shaking. So for each of those earthquakes that could occur, we want to predict how strong the ground shaking could have been at the site or, or could be at the site in a future rupture. And then we'll put those two models together and see what they imply about the possible um, occurrence rates of rare strong amplitude shaking. Okay, so that's the idea. Let's talk just in a little bit of detail about um, those inputs. So the first thing we need is a model for earthquake sources. And so what we think about is a um, particular location. So you could take this location, uh, Yerba Buena Island, just to illustrate. Um, this is a location near San Francisco in California. And then we would all want to look in some radius around that location and say, where could be the sources of earthquakes? And so this, in this case, the black lines 
are drawing surface projections of known earthquake sources in the area. Um, so it could be these faults like the Hayward Fault and the San Andreas Fault that are labeled here. There also could be occurrences of earthquakes that are not on known faults and we'll consider that as well. So for each of those sources we want to think about how often would earthquakes occur and how large could those earthquakes be. The other ingredient is we need to think about the resulting earthquake ground motions. So um, here on the left is a map of observed peak ground accelerations from a, an earthquake that occurred in 1999 in Taiwan large magnitude 7.6 earthquake, and it was, it was well recorded because Taiwan has a lot of ground motion instruments. The, the gray rectangle in the middle of the um, figure shows the approximate um, surface projection of where the earthquake rupture happened. And then the, the dots indicate locations of instruments that recorded the earthquake, and the coloring indicates the strength of the peak ground acceleration. So we see the uh, darker colors in close to the rupture, um, where the staking was very strong. And then as you move away more distant, the colors get lighter um, as the shaking was less intense. Okay? Those same peak ground accelerations are plotted versus the, the distance. So this is the distance from the station to the, the closest point on the rupture. And we can see a, a general trend of decreasing peak ground accelerations with distance. Um, so we can take lots of observations like these and build up models for how strong the shaking would be as a function of the distance away from the rupture, how strong the rupture was, and, and some other um, parameters that influence the ground shaking intensity. But notice importantly that the, um, the ground shaking amplitudes vary quite dramatically around this, um, this red line, which is kind of a typical or you know, median value of the peak ground acceleration. So, um, you know, looking at a distance of say 10 kilometers away from the fault, the, the peak ground accelerations are down as low as about a tenth of a G and up as large as a, about one G. So there's a factor of 10 variation in those amplitudes for nominally the same distance away from the rupture. And that's just because of the complexity of the earthquake rupture process. It means that all, not all locations are equally subjected to shaking due to complexities of wave propagation and, and interference and things as, they, um, as the seismic waves radiate out and uh, result in shaking amplitudes at the surface. And so our predictions are gonna necessarily need to be probabilistic. There's not a single prediction of peak ground acceleration that we could make as a function of distance in this case. And so we'll need some um, probability distributions for these peak ground accelerations. Okay, but if we put together those two, uh, this slide with the previous one, we could say, well, how often are, could all these different earthquakes occur nearby my site? And then the ground motion um, modeling is gonna tell us well, how strong the shaking could be from those different ruptures. And we'll put those together to make inferences about ground motion occurrences. So let's do a very simple example to try to think about the mechanics of how that would come together. So this, uh, I've simplified away lots of things that, that will have to be considered in a more realistic calculation but it'll give us a good idea of the ingredients of a seismic hazard analysis calculation. So let's, uh, let's work through this. So this upper left um, gray rectangle is kind of an idealized map of a situation we'd like to study. So I've got a, a site in the middle where we'd like to figure out the likelihood of ground shaking. And then we've got two earthquake sources nearby. I'll just call them uh, um, rupture one and rupture two. So these are two ruptures that could occur and produce ground shaking at my site. Uh, and let's say we've, through you know, various studies, we've come up with these occurrence probabilities. It says in a given year, we've got these annual occurrence probabilities. Rupture one occurs with 0.05 probability per year. So one in 20 chance per year that we have that rupture. Rupture two has a 0.01 probability per year. So that's more rare. Okay, so we know how often the, these things occur on average. And then this table one over on the upper right gives us um, some very simple predictions of ground shakings. And so um, if we have a rupture, either rupture one or rupture two, we're gonna make a very simple model here that there's only three values of peak ground acceleration that could occur, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, or 0 0.3 G. Of course, in a realistic problem, this would vary continuously, but just to illustrate the mechanics, let's assume there's only three things that could happen. So rupture one has a, an 80% chance of seeing uh, 0.1 G, 18% chance of 0.2 G, and only a 2% chance of 0.3 G. So, Probably a, a small shaking is most likely, but some possibility of stronger shaking. Rupture two produces a, a stronger level of, of ground shaking in a probabilistic sense. So there's a 40% chance of 0.1 G, 40% chance of 0.2 G, and a 20% chance of 0.3 G. Right? So, so given a rupture, uh, rupture two is, is 10 times more likely than rupture one to produce a 0.3 G ground shaking, 
But rupture two is also um, doesn't occur as often. Right? It only occurs one fifth as often as rupture one. And so this illustrates kind of some of the um, issues when we do these hazard analysis calculations. That we have more than one source nearby our site often that could produce strong shaking. Uh, some of, some of those sources are more active than others. Others are more capable of producing strong shaking than others, either because they're closer to the site or they can produce stronger, mag larger magnitudes or things like that. Okay. So that's, that's kind of the, the bare essence of what we would need for a hazard analysis calculation. And let's do a couple calc uh, quick calculations down below just to think about how this gets put together. So if I want to know the pro annual probability of a peak ground acceleration of 0.3 g, there's kind of two ingredients here. One is kind of how often, you know, what's the annual probability that I would see an earthquake? And then second, given that I see that earthquake, what's the probability that it could produce a 0.3 g peak ground acceleration? Term. So what I'll do if I want to do this calculation is I can think about, well, maybe rupture one could produce a 0.3 g. In order for rupture one to produce a 0.3 g, first I need a rupture one, and that's going to happen with 0.05 probability per year. Okay. And then if rupture one occurs, right, given that earthquake, rupture one has a 0.02 probability of producing 0.3 g. So the 0 0.05 times the um, 0 0.02 gives me a 0 0.001 probability per year that rupture one could produce a 0.3 g. Right. There's another way that I could get a 0.3 g though, which is if rupture two occurs. Um, so rupture two, I'm gonna add that probability, right? So either rupture one could occur or rupture two could occur. So with rupture two, there's a 0 0.01 probability that it occurs. And uh, let me kind of drop some numbers in here, or some arrows. Okay, and if rupture two occurs with that 0.01 probability per year, then there's a 0.2 probability that it could produce 0.3 g. <laughs> okay, so I've got a 0.002 probability from that rupture. Okay, and then um, let's ignore the the likelihood of both uh, earthquakes happening in a given year. All right, in, in our more involved calculations, we would uh, consider that also, and we wouldn't want to kind of, uh, we'd want to make a small numerical adjustment. It wouldn't make a big difference. Um, in this case, let's just add those two probabilities and say that's a good approximation. So we would end up with 0 0.003 probability per year that we could see 0.3 g. Right? And so that's, a, that's kind of the number we're interested in for our ground motion hazard curve. Um, and we can get there by putting together these two models for the earthquake occurrences and the ground motions. Right? And that's the idea. Okay, Oop. so let's do one more calculation. If we want to do probability of PGA greater than or equal to Sorry, let's, let's do greater than or equal to 0.2 g um, to uh, um, play with this one. So now if I want to do greater than or equal to 0.2 g, I need to think about kind of all the outcomes that are 0.2 g or larger. So if, to do this probability, uh, again, I need to think about rupture one or rupture two causing this ground motion amplitude. So I'm still going to have a 0.05 probability for rupture one. And then to get a greater than or equal to 0.2 g, I've got the 0.02 probability of, of 0.3 g, and I've got a 0.18 probability of 0.2 g. So both of those would result in a peak ground acceleration of greater than 0.2 g. Okay, and then for rupture two, again, we have a 0.01 probability that rupture two occurs in a given year. And then we have a 0.4 probability of seeing 0.2 G and a 0.2 probability of seeing 0.3 G, which counts as an exceedance of 0.2 G. And if we put that all together, then we have 0.16 probability per year of seeing 0.2 G or larger. So that's the idea, and we could, we could continue on. We could do the same calculation for exceeding 0.1 g as well.
and I'll leave that to you if you're, you're interested. Uh, the calculation is also in the book. So we can take those numbers and look at them in graphical form as well. So here's a plot of peak ground acceleration on the horizontal axis um, that we were just looking at. And then we've got probability of peak ground acceleration greater than, sorry, this should be greater than or equal to x in one year. And uh, so then we can continue here. So the let's let's take a look. So the 0.3g we just did our calculation with this with this top number here. Um, so this was our 0. Um, 0.003 that we calculated, and then the greater than or equal to 0.2g we had a 0. 0.16 that we calculated on the previous slide, and then we could we could get a similar number for 0.1g, but we didn't do that calculation. All right. And then here I just drew lines between the circles to kind of think this through. I said in the example setup that only three discrete values of peak ground acceleration were possible, so these lines don't really um, match my problem description. In a real problem where the peak ground acceleration varies continuously, we could have a continuous curve, kind of like I've illustrated here. All right. Another thing that's, that's interesting to look at here is I've got the two other lines down below in the other colors. These are the, the source one and source twos for the rupture one and rupture two. Um, and we can see how they contribute individually, right? So that's the, the red text and the blue text that I put together when I was doing the summations. We can see how each source contributes. And, and what we see is that, um, you know, if we come up back up for a second for this 0.3G ground motion, the rupture two actually contributed more. This was 0 0.002 versus 0 0.001 for rupture one. So even though rupture one is more frequent than rupture two, rupture two is much more likely to produce this strong ground shaking we're interested in, okay, so it contributes more. And so we see that in the figure that this uh, kind of light blue curve has got a higher um, probability that's contributing to the total of 0.03. As we go to lower amplitudes, that's not the case, uh, and that's because the rupture one is capable of producing these, these amplitudes that we're interested in uh, with reasonably high probability, and since it's more frequent, it's contributing more. And so we can weigh both the frequency of occurrence of these ruptures with how likely they are to produce the shaking amplitude that we're interested in. Okay, so that's a, a quick tour, but a, but a hint of some of the insights that we can get out of these seismic hazard analysis calculations. Okay, so we might as well talk about this a little bit more formally. Um, so here's the, the calculation that we're gonna do when we uh, introduce a little more details. So the idea is we're gonna, t we're gonna talk about um, the rate and typically an annual rate of the ground motion amplitude um, metric IM, intensity measure, uh, exceeding some threshold. And we're going to compute that as this, the sum over all ruptures. So we're going to, just like we summed over two ruptures in the a simple example, if there's more ruptures that are possible, which typically there are in a real problem, we'll do this summation over all the ruptures. And then we'll have a term here which is the ground motion prediction. Or, um, yeah. that, and that comes from a ground motion model. And that's the, the, the table that we had in the upper right corner of the simple example just now. We'll have that in a little bit more refined form. And that's gonna be a function of the rupture characteristics as well as the, the site properties. Um, and then we're gonna have a term over here, which is the rate of rupture I. So how often does each individual rupture occur? And that's the, the 0.05 and 0.01 probabilities that we used in the simple example. So we'll do this in terms of rates rather than annual probabilities, which will have some um, mathematical benefits. But we still have those two terms, the kind of how often do the ruptures occur, and then what's the probability that that rupture produces the ground motion amplitude that we're interested in. Okay. So that's the, that's the idea, and, and of course we can add lots of um, sophistication to both of those models, but the essence of the uh, calculation is illustrated by that simple example we just did. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this uh, video. A couple uh, notes on um, uh, conclusions. So again, we can't observe these ground motion hazard curves um, directly from observations because the amplitudes we're interested in are so rare. And so instead, we, we put together those two input models. We've got what we call a seismic source model. So what's the rate of occurrence of earthquakes of different types? And then we have a ground motion model, which tells us what's the probability that each one of those earthquake ruptures can produce ground motion amplitudes of interest to us.
and we'll put them together with that summation like we illustrated and, um, and get out the rate of occurrence of the ground motion amplitudes we're interested in. Okay? And we did a very simple hazard calculation to gain a little bit of intuition about how this would work and, and hopefully that seems like a reasonable calculation to you uh, and motivates you to go into more depth for understanding how the realistic calculations work. Okay, that's all for this video. I hope that was a useful introduction for you.